All right, let's get going. So uh, key concepts for today, race versus ethnicity, and we're gonna talk about culture. Uh, talk about defining culture. Uh, this N-word policy, I believe that it is on your syllabus. Let me remind you guys, there still seems to be some people who like have not read the syllabus, uh, people who have not uh, heard me say several times that um, the, that the, when I say syllabus, I'm referring to the PDF, um, which, uh, which you need to download from, uh, Canvas, uh, and if anybody missed it, Dan recently updated the syllabus and emailed everybody, uh, so make sure if the version that you are referencing, make sure the version you're referencing is the latest version. Uh, okay, so. Uh oh, what's going on here? Maybe uh, let's put the computer closer to the edge here. My aim today will be to end a few minutes early. It's not my general. Uh, it's not my general habit, uh, but I want to try to end a little bit early. Uh, if people have questions, and then I'm going to try to do, and, and again, on Tuesday, our midterm is on Thursday. On Tuesday, I'm going to try to lecture also maybe only for half the period, and the other half will be for uh, midterm review. Midterm review, I'm not going to prepare anything. I'm going to come here prepared to answer your questions. So the better, the clearer your questions are, uh, the better you're going to do on the midterm. And I'm also going to provide these slides to you. Uh, as I think it says up here, it's going to have some definitions. Um, so these will be available for you on uh, Top Hat. Okay, here's a quote from KRS-One. This is a critical approach to race. So I haven't defined race for you up to this point, have I? We've talked about race. We've talked about race being a social construct. Spent a fair bit of time talking about that in class. You don't have to write this down. Okay? Make your notes on it. Write down your thoughts on this. Don't write these words down because I told you the slides are going to get. And if I'm talking to you while you're typing, you're not hearing the words that I'm saying, and therefore you're not learning the lesson. So, but we can read this together. Race is a white colonial class distinction. It is the way in which invaders and colonizers organized and identified their captured and enslaved populations. This is what KRS-1, is how KRS-1 is describing what race is. This is from a, a lecture series which she's developing into a book called Black Oustery, as opposed to History Oustery. A philosophical look at black and history. Now, if you notice, I already told you guys Karis one is one of my mentors. But prior to him writing this, uh, you could check out this article that I wrote called Hip Hop's Origins as Organic Decolonization. And uh, you see, this is how I've defined race. So my definite, I've given you the way I define politics. You guys remember what that is. Dynamics of power in social relations. Do you remember, have I defined power for you? Have I given you a definition of power? No? Yeah? I think I, I, think I have. Um, but we can review it. What, did I, what is the definition I gave you? Let me wait, let me get your mic. Uh, power is the ability to cause someone to do what they would otherwise not do. Yeah, okay. 
So now, OK, now, anybody else who has it in their notes, do you have it with any slightly different wording? I have that. I you have the different wording? I have okay. the different wording. OK, let's see, let's see who else has it. Who else has it in their notes? A similar definition. Is it the precise words that he read or slightly different? OK, here, go ahead. So read it, read it a different way. Maybe wrote it down somewhere else. I just remember us using the word make instead of cause. Yeah, so just say the phrase that way. Uh, now I'm blanking on it. You, but you don't have it in your notes? No. I'm, okay, you're I from memory. Notes. You know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, that's even better. Try it. Try it from memory. Uh, power is basically causing someone to do something that they normally wouldn't do. Okay, that's what he said, right? Cause. So now you say it. Without Power the word cause. Is making someone do something that they normally wouldn't do. Okay. You guys remember this discussion now? Is this ringing a bell? Yeah. So, yeah, I remember we had the talk between like using the words get and make. Like, I have that written down here. So, we, the, you could the say words like, what? Get and make. Get, okay. Just talk a little bit slower just to make sure everybody is catching it, right? So, because these are very fine distinctions we're making, right? Like, what the question is, what difference does it make, right? If we just change one little word like this, does it make a difference or not? In some cases, it doesn't. There's lots of words you can exchange of a in a given sentence, and there isn't a difference in meaning. But sometimes there is, right? So, go ahead. So like what I have written down is the ability to get others to do what they would not normally do. OK. So read the whole phrase nice and clear and slow. The ability to get others to do what they would not normally do. Would not normally do. That's how you have it. OK. So, there, so to my ear, not looking at it on paper, I hear two differences. I hear two words that were different, not just the get versus the make versus the cause, but was there another word that was different from the one that you read? Um, or was that the same, except for that one word? Uh, he didn't have otherwise. Otherwise. He said normally. OK. So now we have um, power is the ability. I'm going to say from memory the first one that I think that was read to the class. Power is the ability to cause someone to do what they otherwise would not do. Did I say it verbatim what you said? Not one word wrong? OK. Then I think what you, I think what you said, Jesse James, um, is uh, power is the ability to get. Make, okay, all right, yeah. Make, yeah, right, okay. So power is the ability to make others do. Now, did you say normally or otherwise? I said normally. You said normally. Okay, so otherwise became normally when you were doing it from your head. And in your notes, you have normally. You don't have otherwise. I have normally. You have normally, okay. I, in my mind, I have it otherwise. In fact, the otherwise that I have otherwise is the word otherwise otherwise known as normally. <laughs> um, so, so in what ways does these, so now, now here's something which I don't know the answer to. In my mind, I never, I wasn't aware. Like, so the way we got to the cause and the get, and we had a discussion about that when I gave this definition. I s probably said the definition two different times, and I said it two different ways. I did not realize that I said it two different ways. I did not realize that one time when I said the definition, I used the word make, and another time I used the word get. It was you guys that pointed that out to me, that I had changed a word like that. And, and now we have, and there's, there's three possibilities. I don't know if I said all three, or if in the discussion, one of you guys said, well, could it be this third thing? So we're talking about, in this exact same sentence, 
defining power, just exchanging this word get, cause, or make. Power is the ability to get someone to do what they otherwise would not do. That's one version. Power is the ability to make someone do what they otherwise would not do. That's the second version. Power is the ability to, what's the third one? Which one? Cause. Power is the ability to cause someone to do what they otherwise would not do. Now, anybody know permutations and combinations? Do a little finite mathematics? Now, that's three different versions of the same sentence. Which I'm not saying to you mean different things. I'm not sure at this point. I haven't even thought it out. Maybe those three sentences are identical in meaning, right? So they are, they could be semantically identical in terms of their meaning, right? They're written differently. There's different words, but they could have the same semantic meaning. The syntactic meaning is definitely the same because the syntax, meaning the grammar, was not changed, right? It's the exact same grammatical structure. We've just changed one of the words three different times. Now, when I said permutations and combinations, what I'm talking about is there's this other word, which I don't know if we talked about it. I don't think we did. What happens if you change otherwise and normally? How does that change the meaning of the sentence? So now, if you have that variant, you have one word which we have one alternate for, so a binary combination. And then the other word, we have a triple combination. How many different possible sentences do we have? Somebody tell me. How many sentences could you make varying those three words and then that two? Six. Six. Simple math. Two times six. There are six different, so now, we're, now we have six different possible definitions. Now listen carefully to what I'm about to say to you now. Listen carefully to this. It might be the case that, let's say we didn't have this conversation. I just had given you my definition. You guys asked me, what, you know, we're hanging out. You say, D, what is power? What is, and I'll just be like, I'll just say my thing. And then, and then another week, some time passes. And then we'll be hanging out again. Somebody else brings it up. And you'll be like, yo, well, D said power is this. It's possible. You have a choice of five different sentences you could say that I might be present and say, yeah, that's exactly what I said. But it's fine. But there's six possible sentences, only one of which I actually said, right? Now, maybe the, all six of these sentences mean the same thing. But maybe they don't. And what is meaning? Meaning is contextual, right? So meaning, so meaning is created in the moment with the people who are there at the time. But we don't imagine that. We don't, we're not aware of that. We don't realize that we are always interpreting meaning in the social setting that we're in. So you will say to somebody, well, Professor D says, power is this. But you have explained it using the word normally. Normally implies what? A normative standard. To lots of people, normal is a synonym for good, as it should be. Not everybody. Some of us think normal is the worst fucking thing you could be. But for those of us who are socialized, into the majority of the mainstream culture, we're socialized into thinking that normally, the normal thing is the norm. The norms of behavior. What is normally expected of a reasonable person. That is language that is not only in the law, but it's in a lot of the UW documentation and policies. Right, so normality is what is expected of you. Now, Otherwise, what somebody otherwise would do or would not do, that has a different kind of valence, right? If you're trying to make, if, so if, 
power is the ability to get someone to do what they normally would not do, right? That means you're taking them outside of the norm. Power is the ability to get someone to do what they otherwise would not do. Otherwise doesn't have the valence of they were going to do the normal thing, and then you took them away from the normal thing. Otherwise me, could mean the opposite. Could mean that you were going to save them from doing the thing which wasn't normal. You were going to save them from doing the wrong thing, and you brought them into conformity with normality, as you normally would, I expect. Or should I expect otherwise? I don't know if you guys get the subtleties here. OK, so anybody think that any, so I'm suggesting to you normally and otherwise based on what I've just said, which I'm just thinking out loud. I haven't, you know, this is just what seems to me to be the case. So I don't know how well this illustrates, I don't know that this is an example of a sentence which we would assert, which you would repeat, you would write in your notes and you would say to someone else, here's the facts. I was present on this date. Professor D said these words. Somebody else in their notes will say something different. I was present on the same date in the same class, but their notes has Professor D saying a different sentence. There are six possible sentences. Now, maybe it's irrelevant because maybe these six sentences mean the same thing, but maybe they don't. And even if these ones do, what I hope you realize this illustrates is that there are for sure some sentences that do have different meanings, but are in your notes and in your mind. And you remember experiences. You have memories of being in a place at a time with certain people. And other people believe that you, that you share that memory. But they are remembering different sentences. different. They remember events differently. And each person is sure that they remember it correctly. If we're talking about social justice, this matters. If we're talking about how we treat each other and how we think about how we deal with differences of opinions, how we deal with different knowledge claims, and we don't, as is all our tendency, Every single one of us, I'm not exempt here, could be worse than a lot of you in this respect. When I say I remember it happened like this, my tendency, just like yours, is to really believe that's how it happened because it's in my memory. Stephen Colbert, you know, pretending to be George Bush, riffing off George Bush, says, I know, I looked it up. I looked it up in my gut. I didn't look it up in a book. I looked it up in my gut, right? But that's what we're all doing. We're looking things up in our gut all the time. And we're so sure that it's true if we remember it. But our memories are fallible. And so this is important when we are having disagreements with people, right? And we're sure they're wrong, and we're sure we're right. Look at this. I, somebody who teaches this, somebody who studies this, somebody who is so attentive to this kind of stuff, still, these little subtleties can go, can go right by me, of my own words. OK, anyway, so here's my definition. So anybody who, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get through these slides today, so we'll, I'm going to skip this discussion about of these six sentences. You know, If we have more time, I would say, let's interrogate them. Let's see if make versus get versus cause if they do, in fact, change the meaning. But I'm going to skip that. You let me know. Send me an email or come talk to me afterwards or see me in office hours if you, if, if you can show me that they do have a different meaning. Anyway, here's my definition of race. So I'm going to break this down for you in simple language. It's, it's uh, spoken here, as you see, in uh, academies, right? Academic, academic knees. Whatever. Um, but what did, have we established about race so far? The arguments that have been presented in class are as follows. 
One, race is a social construct. That's clear. That's the claim here. It's not the claim everywhere. And what is the contrary claim? Contrary claim is that race is a biological fact or a physical fact or a mind-independent reality, something that is created by material facts external to the ideas and the social world, the social environment that we're in. That's the contrary claim. A social construct means that, doesn't mean it's not real, it's a, it's a huge, very easy mistake that people make when they're talking about social construction. They say, something is a social construction, therefore it's not real. Wrong. Okay? You fail this class intellectually if you walk out of here and you think that, oh, it's socially constructed, that means it's not real. Okay? But there's a good reason why lots of people make that mistake. Especially when we're talking about things which we know are not only socially constructed, but we wish they were not socially constructed at all or the way that they are. So if we're acknowledging that racism is socially constructed, and we know that racism is wrong, then, we, then it's easy to jump to uh, socially constructed is not real. Come on. Right? But there's a danger. Right? The danger is that we are then denying the reality, the real consequences, the material consequences of the fact that we live in a world which is structured by race. The social structure positions us, the structure of society that we live in, culturally, legally, and beyond. Our social world is structured in a way that slots us into racial categories, that causes us to be placed in and place others in these categories, and to be uncomfortable when we can't figure out what category a person belongs in. We gotta, we gotta know, well, which one are they? Right? That compulsion that you have is not a natural, uh, not a natural des uh, primordial desire that human beings have to know what race somebody is. That concept was invented at a certain time in history, and KRS-One has the same, pinpoints its origins in the same place as Kwame Torre, otherwise known as Stokely Carmichael, and Charles Hamilton plays it, namely, at the origins of capitalism and slavery and colonialism. So what KRS-One argues, and this should be, this is very similar to what you read in the Black Power book, race is a white colonial class distinction. What does that mean, a white colonial class distinction? It's the way in which invaders and colonizers organized and identified their captured and enslaved populations. That's what he's arguing. This goes along, out and telling you, in my opinion, this is commensurate with the way that race is conceptualized, not, not the precise wording, but the conceptual meaning, this aligns with the conceptual meaning you got in the Black Power book. It does not align with the mainstream way of understanding race. It does not align with the way that most of you thought about race before you took this class, or before you, maybe before you walked in the room today. And, Sadly for me and KRS-One and many others, even after you leave today and when you're done with this class, this may not be the way that you think about race. But if you continue to think that race is just a corporeal factor of your skin color, corporeal meaning body, then 
you're wrong, in my very humble opinion. Um, so, so what I wrote in my hip hop in my article, "Hip Hop's Origins as Organic Decolonization," is that races are colonial subjectivities reified as inherent identities. Sounds really dope, right? You want to put it in a rap, obviously. Um, what I'm so what are subjectivities? It's subjective, right? You all know the difference between objective and subjective. Somebody's opinion is subjective. Somebody's perspective is subjective, right? Um, let me illustrate this in a real simple way, but I'm going to make something really complicated out of it, so follow me here. Sammy. Uh, you would agree that you are on the uh, left side of the stage. You d why are you shaking your head? What side of the stage is he on? On the right side. Are you, are you, are you, try are you intentionally misleading everybody? Your student says you're on the right side. You're on the left side. You're sure. I am sure, yes. Okay, so why are you misleading the class? <laughs> why do we have a student trying to sabotage the learning of all the other students? Right? Of course, what's the answer? Right? From from your to your right side. Stage left. Stage left. Exactly. So we have some terminology for it, right? But the what the point I'm illustrating is that. It's very much like the, the thing, the exercise we just went through with the sentence, right? From the subjective vantage that you are sitting, he's on the right. But because we're facing you, mirror image, we have a different vantage from us. It's a matter of fact. Even when I, w did you notice, like, when I said, are you sure? You, like, looked at your hand. And also, I did that when I asked you. I'm like, you're on the, my left. Right? And you checked, uh, it's the left, for sure. Right? Now, if we had a vote, we'd be outvoted. Because there's more people who have a different vantage than us. Obviously, we're right that we're on the left. <laughs> right? What if we talked about it years from now? So that like, it wasn't, we, weren't sitting, we weren't in the vantages at the time. What if we're all sitting together and all our right is the same right? then we'd be even more likely not to figure out why we are having a different memory. Okay, now the stage left, this is a, it's a, as I told you, it's a very basic, simple example. But the vantage, where you are when you hear something, the context that you're in, where you're sitting or standing, has a huge impact on how you see and how you understand what's going on, and you don't realize it. We all do not realize how much the other people in the same environment with us, who we remember being in the room, who we remember where we were when this historical event took place, when these elections happened, we think that we all remember the same thing, but we don't all remember the same thing, right? We don't all interpret it the same way. So subjectivities are our subjective experiences, our subjective identities, and all our identities are, are shaped by the experiences we've had, by the knowledge we've been exposed to. And even, and even our twin, you know, your hypothetical identical twin, who has spent all their lives right next to you, to your left, right? Even that person has had a different subjective experience of life than you. So they've seen different things, and you're assuming that they've seen the same thing. You're a sibling. You're assuming that they understand the same thing. You guys talk a lot, and most of the time, you remember the things exactly as they were, and then you get really angry with your friend or your sibling or your mom or whoever when they remember this shit differently because you assume that you guys objectively are, you, that you're both experiencing the world objectively in the same way, but you are subjectively experiencing the world. So all your information is partial. Now, colonial subjectivities, 
you can just say, in this context, you can say subjectivities are identities. You can use that to understand it. Now, keep in mind, that is a shortcut to understanding it. It doesn't have the identical meaning. If I wrote races are colonial identities, that doesn't mean exactly the same thing as colonial subjectivities. So I'm giving you identities as a shortcut way to understand it, and I'll do the same for these other words. Reified, I know a lot of people haven't heard the word reified before. Anybody know, like, what's, a, what's, a, what's an approximate um, synonym you could put in there? Yeah? Like masked, or Masked, or what else? This is, actually, you know what, this is good. Justified. Justified, that's good. Anybody else? Shout out, shout, shout out possibilities. You know what, this is, this is even really good for people who don't know what the word means but are guessing at it. Like what other words could fit in there that would make sense of the sentence for you? Described. Described? Okay, races are colonial subjectivities. Described as in, yeah. Yeah, that could work. It has a, it has a similar, very similar meaning to what I intend, right? So, you know, you're doing this all the time, right? You're, you encounter words that you don't really understand. This is how you've learned all your words. Most of them you didn't look up in a dictionary. Most of the words that you've learned in your life, you've learned from context and you've like sort of done a word association. You figure out, okay, based on the context, it must mean this. So you might look at that and be like reified. I don't know what that is, but you might think races are colonial subjectivities represented as inherent identities. Uh, you might say, if you, were, if you were a little more fancy, or if you're a chemistry major, maybe you say, races are colonial subjectivities crystallized as inherent identities. Or you could say misrepresented as, right? There's lots of different things that you could interpret. Now, reified has a particular meaning. You could look it up in the dictionary. I'll refrain from defining every single word. Um, but I just want... I want to drive home this point because you know, I mentioned this earlier in class. I want to let you know I can explain this in more common language, more everyday language. But it's not the case that I am using academic language just for the sake of it, to make it sound complicated. It's not why. Some people are doing that. But I've done that, I've written this in this way because there's a very specific meaning that I intend. Comparing these two definitions, which one, which one do you find more clear and why? Yeah. Uh, I think that KRS-One's definition is a little clearer okay. because it sort of just states his short definition quickly and then goes on and explains it in more of the academic terms, okay. whereas the, yours is a little more mixed and all in the academic terms. Okay, nice. So, like, so before and after that semicolon. So the, so the definition is just everything up to that semicolon, races a white colonial class distinction. And then he has an elaboration there, which gives it more clarity. That's a great answer. Um, other people? Anybody, did everybody agree that the first one is, is uh, more clear than the second one? Anybody feel differently? It has to be one or the other. You either think it's the first one's more clear. No, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It could be they're equally unclear. Um, oh. I think that the first one, like you said, like it states the, his definition and then goes on to explain, but I think the fact that it needs elaboration might mean that it's not as clear, because like, saying that it's a white colonial class distinction, I could kind of go anywhere with that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's um, more ambiguous. Which is, right, which is why it requires the part that's after the semicolon. Okay. Okay. Excellent point. So, so let me ask you. One other thing, Marie. Um, 
if we hadn't just talked about it now, right? If you uh, if you just if you just read them both, which one would you find more clear? So definitely the second one's more concise, and it's more precise. That's what I take from what you're saying. It's more concise, more precise. But given that, no, I think you already answered that. I think it's, I think you made a good point, right? So uh, so. The first one is more clear in the sense that there's a statement of like what it is, and then there's some more context, more elaboration. Um, so that's one sense, that's one meaning of the word clarity. Another meaning of the word clarity, which Marie is using in the way that she's arguing that the second one is more clear, has to do with precision and concision. These are the exact words, right? I'm not disagreeing with KRS-One. I learned from KRS-One. He wrote this after I wrote this, but I learned everything I know from KRS-One and Chuck D, Queen Latifah. So, and other people, and my mom. Um, she's my first teacher. Very good, she's a very good teacher. Um, so, this is, so, th so this illustrates the point, actually, very well, of like why I'm using this language. And this language has a particular purpose. It serves a particular purpose. Um, and it is, and is most appropriate to convey the idea in a particular way to a particular audience at a particular time. If you really want to know what it is, this is what you need. But if you've got to convey it to an audience that doesn't understand these words, it doesn't have the time, to like understand this concise definition, you've got to do something a little bit more elaborate. But this other one, which sounds more clear to you, and you know, I didn't hear from the rest of you, but my guess is that most people agree with the first answer, is that this feels like it's more clear to you. Feels like it's more clear because there's more words that are familiar to you, and it gives this clearer context. But, Assuming that you understand these words in this second sentence, if you understand these, right? So if you understand subjectivities, let's even just say identities, even if you just understand it as that, or our social, our social positionality in the, let's say, our, let's say our positioning, our relative positioning in the social environment, in the social world, let's say that. In the socio-political, cultural, in the total context. If you understand subjectivities in that way, reified, we've done a lot of synonyms, they're pretty good. Represented as or misrepresented as, what did you say? Described as um, inherent identities. Inherent, what does inherent mean? Inherent is like primordial, it's like uh, unchangeable, right? If something is inherent, if my race is inherent to my identity, that means it could never be otherwise. I could never have an identity that was not this particular race. That's how we are all taught race. You are born your race, you're gonna die your race. We are not taught that you may be born with this particular race in the US based on the social context, but you go to Ghana and you're a different race. Or you go to Latin America and people are telling you you're a different race. That's not what we're taught. But that is the experience of some people. That is the reality. We are taught that race is a factor of skin color. And you are also taught that there was this, the most evil person in history, rounded up six million people, and genocided them because of their race. And you know they're the same color. So, and you don't notice, you don't have cognitive dissonance there. But you should. That's proof that race is not about skin color. It is most commonly in our everyday experience, in the social context that we're in, it's represent, it is most viscerally skin color. But if you don't understand that, in, that it changes, that the criteria changes 
from one historical, temporal, national context to another, the justification, the stories, the lies, the representations. And this is what we mean. When you say race is a social construct, therefore it's not real, this is what you're trying to say. What you're trying to say is that there are a bunch of lies that are being represented to us as truths about race. That is the truth. It doesn't mean that race isn't real. It means that there's a whole lot of lies disguising what race actually is. And what it is, according to my professors and according to your professor, not all your professors, okay, one in particular, my favorite, well, I don't know who your other professors are, but um, what is being disguised is the colonial relationship, relationship of domination, relationship of superordination and subordination. And when we're talking about the colonial relationship, we're not only talking about overseas colonies, we're talking about, as you learned in the Black Power book, we're talking about internal colonies. We're talking about Aborigines in Australia. We're talking about Native American reservations in the US. We're talking about ghettos. We're talking about when Mob Deep says, the projects is front line and the enemy gets one time. I ain't gotta tell you, it's right in front of your eyes. What they're talking about is the colonial situation of the ghetto where one time, which is the police, are viscerally, it's clear that the way people are kept in line is through violence, straight up physical violence. Those of us who are steps removed from that environment, it's harder for us to see that, that, that our contemporary moment, that the world we live in, the country we live in, is predicated on this kind of violence. We don't, we don't see that. When we experience, if we're here at the university, those of us who are subjected to racism, we're subjected to microaggressions, as we discuss. Doesn't mean the shit is not racist, doesn't mean it doesn't suck, but it's not a daily confrontation with people with guns who can kill us with impunity. That's not the kind of colonialism that we are experiencing daily if we are privileged enough to be here. But if you follow the money, if you follow the commodities, if you follow the laws and how the laws have been changed and replaced with other laws that perpetuate this dynamic, these relationships, if you figure out, if you say like, Okay, well, what is Latino really? Why do these categories, as we've discussed, why do these categories make no sense? They make no sense because they are hiding a reality. The reality they are hiding is that people have been divided in so that we will see each other as inherently different with inherently different interests, inherently different perspectives, and thus we don't share a common interest. We don't constitute a common working class, a common humanity. We constitute fundamentally different people, and this is, which it is true by the way, we do constitute fundamentally different people, but many of these divisions are socially constructed to perpetuate social injustice. That's the point that we're getting at here. Okay, now, race and ethnicity. We've all talked, we've talked quite a bit about this. Does race equal ethnicity? I'm saying to you, no, it doesn't. But isn't that weird? Because how often do you notice that we, all of us, talking about ethnicity in one sentence and race in the next sentence. So how can they be different? Well, the fact is they are often used interchangeably. I'm gonna give you these slides. You should write down your thoughts about the slides. Write down your thoughts about what I'm saying. Ask your questions to me now, here. 
when you have the opportunity. Who knows if I'll be here next week. I could be anywhere on the planet or I could be off the motherfucking planet. It's possible. I could quote a whole bunch of rap lines, you know? But you all know, none of us are promised tomorrow. And some of us are building rocket ships. So, you know, Elon Musk with muscles if he was down for the struggle, right? So anyway, ethnic identities predate racial identities. They are social constructs. They have that in common. Ethnic identities arise from different historical processes than race. The argument that you're getting here, as I've told you before, I, you know, I've given you this caveat many times, you don't have to agree, you can have a totally different opinion, but what we are learning, the, diff the perspective that I want you to be aware of, that you're not aware of from mainstream education, is that according to critical African-American scholarship, according to critical Africana studies, race is a product, race is a social construction of what? Of the colonial relationship of identities, of subjectivities created through colonialism to justify colonialism and capitalism and slavery, right, through these historical processes. And that's not the case of ethnicity. Okay, ethnicity is something that is also socially constructed. It's also, there's lots of similarities. That's why it works, that's why it's easy to inter interchange them or slide from one to the other. Because we're also taught that ethnicity is more or less something you don't get to change. Ethnicity can also be mobilized as a way for you to get what you want if you're using it agentially. It's also a way for people to get you to do things that you otherwise would not do. What's that called, right? Um, through appealing to your ethnicity, saying, you're not being yourself. You're not behaving the way a good Jewish boy should, a good Italian boy should. You're talking in a way that isn't, why are you trying to talk white? You know? So these things are mobilized in ways that are very similar. But you also might mobilize it to your advantage, right? When I give this definition of power, a lot of people hear that definition of power as inherently negative, like I'm saying power is necessarily a bad thing. Power is the ability to get someone to do what they otherwise would not do. Does that feel to you guys like kind of a negative way of defining it? I wouldn't be surprised if it does, but think about this. Why would it sound negative? Because it's like, oh, well, people, if the person wanted to do this thing, you made them do this other thing, that's not nice. Didn't let them do what they wanted to do. But what if, what if the person was myself, right? What if I was going to do something, but I have the power to stop myself from doing the thing I was going to do and changing what I do? We've all experienced situations where we want to stop ourselves from doing something and we can't seem to stop ourselves. So we're lacking power over ourselves. We should have that power. We want to have that power. What's, what is preventing us from having that power? Could be the socially constructed norms of ethnicity or race or citizenship, a good American should do this and not that, right? These could be discourses, if you're not recognizing the, how subjective they are, how they are socially constructed to justify the existing social structure, if you're not aware of that, then it can disempower you from doing what you want to do. Now, similarly, what if the person is not? What if you are exercising power on somebody else, making, making them, let's say making, right? That's the most forceful. Make them do what they otherwise would not do. If you get, what, here's, a, here's a variation, let them do. That's very, that sounds very different. Power is the ability to let others do what they otherwise would not do. That sounds very different. But essentially, same thing. Make someone do what they otherwise would not do. If you were going to... What if you guys were all about to fail the exam? All right? And then I gave you the power 
You know, I made you do something you otherwise were not going to do. So it's not necessarily negative. And there's lots of similarities between ethnicity and race. But here's the difference. Ethnicity is something that, go, that does go back much further to mid, before medieval, to antiquity, all of that stuff. There is ethnicity. There is not race. Race is invented over the, over the last 500 years. Race is invented through capitalism, slavery, colonialism. So, if that's the case, why do we slide back and forth between race and ethnicity? There's lots of different reasons. One of them is so that we can hide the fact that race is colonial. That's one reason. To obscure the fact that the power dynamics that obtain between racially superordinate and racially, racially subordinate populations, communities, countries, polities, reservations, is the colonial relationship. That's why. All right, same thing. I'll give you these slides. Okay, so we generally talk about culture. I'm going to end in five minutes. What is culture? Common conceptions. Here's one way of defining culture. I'm end, like I said, I'm going to end 15 minutes early. What is culture? A whole way of life, very common way of defining it. It's a good way of defining it. But what, it's concise, easy to understand, but it lacks some precision, right? Cultural essentialism. We've talked about how racial essentialism is a problem. What's racial essentialism? Racial essentialism is this idea, is believing that race is an inherent identity. Inherent identity is a, is an, a material, inherent property of your body could never be otherwise. You don't get to have another body in this life. You don't get to have another race in this life. Nobody made it up. It's got nothing to do with politics. I'm arguing not the case. Cultural essentialism is the false belief that cultures are naturally and discreetly bounded. Which is another way of saying are inherently different, are inherently distinct. There's the West and the rest. There's Eastern culture and Western culture. They are fundamentally different. There's a clear dividing line. There's Europe. And there's the East, the Occident and the Orient. Has anybody yet come to the realization that the European continent is a very silly fiction? Like, you know, how is the, is Africa, is Europe, is the East? It's very funny, right? It's just, it's just this is coast. Well, we're a separate continent. It's ideological. That's geographic essentialism. I'll give you a bonus essentialism. It's not on the slides. Common errors. Cultural essentialism. In cultural studies, which is the kind of class that you have found yourself in, talk about hip hop culture. So one way that we def and why are we calling why does why are we calling hip hop a culture? Why is KRS One and Africa Bambata Defining hip hop as a culture and saying, no, you don't, if you think it's just music, you do not understand. Why? Because we want to say it's a whole way of life. Why? Because we want to claim the right to define the values and the meaning of hip hop culture. And if we say it's just the music, then that takes away some of our agency from defining what it is. And look at this. This is what cultures are, according to cultural studies. Cultures are the frameworks by which groups attribute meaning to the social and material world. So if hip hop is a culture, then hip hoppers use hip hop culture as a way to interpret, define, 
create meaning, create a framework for understanding the social and material world. If hip hop is just music, then whatever, then it's just rapping on a beat. Can you rap? Or you're making a beat? Or you're break, can you dance? Right? But if it's a culture, then it is a mode. Then what, what, we're, what are we doing with our rhymes? What are we doing with our bodies when we dance? We are defining how, who we are. Right? Now, not everybody in the room identifies as a hip hopper. But you are all enmeshed in culture in various ways. And the extent to which you can recognize that the way whatever culture you are told is yours, whatever culture is ascribed to you, could be national culture, could be ethnic culture, could be culture associated with an, a particular notion of your race which is ascribed to you. But to whatever extent you and your peers are cognizant of the way this is not natural, discrete, obvious, inherent, but that it is constructed, that it is interest-laden. When you understand that it's presented in a certain way and it could be presented otherwise, it's defined in a certain way and you can define it otherwise. You can say, fuck that shit, I think it means this. I don't agree. I don't think that if I'm a boy, I have to behave this way. I must like this thing. I can decide otherwise. I can create a different kind of culture. I can create a different kind of community. We can create a different kind of world. If you understand that, then you are living and doing cultural studies. You're creating yourself and you have the ability to create a world which is different than the one you currently live in. If you fail to learn this lesson, then it doesn't mean, it's not simply you won't be a good fucking rapper, you won't, but it also means that you won't be able to change the world in the way that you need to change it. The end, for now. So uh, let's do uh, attendance real quick. And uh, 